uh, we're in the book of Genesis, as, as you may know, uh, first book of the Bible. So feel free to open your word there or find the Bible app on your phone. We'd love to have you uh, be looking at the word of God as I preach it this morning, because uh, it's not anything about my words, but it's all about God's words and what the Lord has to say for us. So I want to encourage you in that this morning. Uh, this passage in some ways may not surprise you this morning, right? A passage about two brothers fighting and one of them killed the other. That seems like almost like a normal day, maybe minus the murder part, but some days you might think it's going that direction, right? And so, unfortunately, in this case, it did go that direction. It really did. One brother really murdered the other. And so, uh, we'll look at that. We'll look at what led up to it that we began to see last week. Eve joyfully had her children with the help of the Lord, and it's the Lord who gives life. And so, we praise God for that, for every single life. It's always a gift from the Lord at the matter of conception. And so we're so, so thankful for uh, every person that we get to meet, that we get to interact with. And so I'm going to read Genesis 4, 3 through 7, part of what we looked at last week, and then we'll read 8 through 15, which will be our primary text for this morning. Genesis 4, 3 through 7. So in the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord uh, out of the ground, and Abel brought an offering of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face or his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is contrary for you, but you must rule over it. Last week, we saw that unbelief flows from pride and becomes anger when we judge God's purposes to be wrong. In other words, we set ourselves up over against God. In other words, we become God. We put our, we don't actually become God, but we set ourselves up as God to judge God's purposes for our lives or for the lives of others. And we are fast overstepping the line, brothers and sisters, when we do that. We continue this morning, Genesis 4, 8 through 15. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel, and he killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Whoever finds me will kill me. And then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone Cain kills Cain, vengeance, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Friends, today we're going to see that persistent unbelief becomes embedded pride, which leads to habitual sin. Of course, it's not the only thing that leads to habitual sin, but it will lead to persistent habitual sin. Persistent unbelief becomes embedded pride, leading to habitual sin. We always need to heed God's warnings. That almost like might seem like it goes without saying, and yet it needs to be said. God gave Cain a particular warning. He said, your face has fallen. If you do well, if you do well, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the word, so I need to go find it in my own Bible here. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin is crouching at your door. That's a warning. Sin is crouching at your door. It wants to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, let me ask you a question. Will God ever tell you to do something that he won't give you the power to do in obedience? No, no, he, he, he's not a snake oil salesman. He is a God who is holy, who's perfect, who's, who, who loves his children. He loves his creation, and yet he gives warnings. He gives directions. He's holy, which means he's right in every single way all the time. And so we must always heed God's warning. They are for your good. And actually, that's part of that initial point, but it's really secondary. 
Even if God's warnings were not for our good, we're always to heed them because we're to obey God because he's God. But in fact, God is good and gracious and kind and loving. And so they are for your good because God is wise. He's the wisest one for any of our circumstances and how we're to live in the way that best brings him glory and brings us joy. And our greatest joy is when we find ourselves worshiping God when we give our lives to him, when we entrust him to be the savior of our life and we live our lives following him and we see God's word and we say, your, your word is like honey to my lips. I love your word. I, maybe you'd say this morning, I don't know God's word, but I'm learning to love God's word. That's a worshipful position, a worshipful stance of moving toward the Lord. So we saw verse seven, God warns Cain and at this point, he hadn't sinned yet because he, I'm sorry, at this point he'd sinned, right? He didn't bring the right offering, but he wasn't too far gone. The Lord says, look, you, you, you've sinned. And, and by the way, friends, it wasn't a mistake. I want to encourage you to, there are mistakes. We make mistakes in life. I've made more than I can count or recount to you today. But there is also sin in life. And we minimize the gravity of sin when we call what we know to be sin a mistake. At this point, all Cain needed to do is confess his sin to the Lord, who was ready to forgive him, who was ready to heal him, who was ready to restore him. Ask for God's help in in assessing his judgment of the situation. Lord, clearly I have something wrong with my heart here. I brought you the wrong offering. Maybe, Maybe he knew why, maybe he knew part of it, but not all of it. He was, he was learning and he was growing. And, but Lord, help me understand how to be more faithful in worshiping you. And he needed to heed God's warning, but he didn't do any of that. He didn't do any of that. Don't let sin, sin rule in your body. God gives us commands to follow. We follow them. We ask God for help in it. We lower our pride and we say to the body of Christ, brothers, sisters, I need your help. I don't want to ask them. Okay, so our pride is starting to show itself already. Do I care more about maintaining my stature before people, or do I care more about glorifying God by obeying him faithfully and saying, you know what? I don't really care what people think of me. I need help learning how to glorify God. What a wonderful posture. What a humble posture. What a Christ-exalting posture to say, I need help. You know who needs help? It's not going to surprise you, this pastor. I need help. I need relationships where brothers can come around me and, and, and hold me accountable who can challenge me, right? I need my, my wife to help me in ways. In fact, there are times when I go to my kids and I say, guys, I'm struggling with something and I want to give you permission. If you see me doing what I'm telling you right now, I need to not do, I need to not do, then I'm going to give you permission to gently, respectfully mention it. Help hold me accountable. We need to grow up depending on one another and letting others speak into our lives. Paul said, don't let sin rule in your uh, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Do you see there's an element of, of personal responsibility and control over the, the decisions that we make? Don't be surprised when you offer your, the members of your body to sin and then you find out, oh, I sinned. Well, of course you did. You walked right to the door. Well, I'm going to walk right to the door, then I'm going to resist it. Got something to prove to yourself? It's pride already. I can do this on my own. No, none of us can. God, I need you. Every moment, every hour, I need you. Verse 13 continues. Well, don't present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been bought, brought from life to death. It's from death to my theology. is really crumbling here. I'm going to, this passage is important, so I'm going to start over. I'm sorry. Romans 6, 12 through 14. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. 
when God says that you're able to prevent sin from ruling in your body by not presenting your members to sin with the help of the Holy, of, Holy Spirit of God, you are able to obey. Well, the devil made me do it. No, the devil maybe tempted you from desires that are already within your heart. If it wasn't a desire in your heart, it actually wouldn't have been tempting. But when he baits the right hook or he puts the right bait on the hook and you find it enticing is because that desire is embedded within your heart. It's something that you love. You're kind of thankful that he baited you. Oh, good. I can have a little bit of it and not eat anymore. And then there's a hook and we get surprised by this. God promises us that with the right desire and the rightly directed effort, you can withstand any temptation that comes your way. No, pastor, you haven't seen the temptations I've had. Well, this is what God's word says. So your issue is not with me. Your issue is with God and his word. First Corinthians 10, 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common, common to man. God is faithful. There's the hinge, friends. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. There is nothing in this verse that says, but with the temptation, he will also provide an easy, obvious, unmissable way of escape that you may be able to not have to fight against temptation very hard. And I don't mean to be condescending. God has provided a way of escape. So Cain, so Oak Grove Church, you must rule over it, over the sin and the temptation that's crouching at your door. Well, how do I do this? What tricks do I need to learn? 1 Peter 5, 8, be so reminded, be watchful. Your adversary, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So in, 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 in Cain's jealousy, he put out the welcome mat for sin. God said, Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Sin is crouching at your door. You must rule over it. And Cain, in his pride, in his stubbornness, you might picture him with crossed arms. Nope. I'm angry that you didn't accept my offering. I'm jealous over my brother. Cain, Cain, son, listen, listen. You need to rule over that. You need to apply what I've given you as a person and not put out the welcome mat for that sin. And when they were in the field, Cain Oh, I skipped ahead. Cain rose up against his brother Abel and he killed him. It's almost comical how this is written in verse 8. Cain spoke to his brother Abel. It's just like he chatted him up. Hey, bro, how's it going? Good. You you seem to be happier. Did you get things sorted out with God? Yeah, we're good. Hey, you want to go out to the field? Sure. Let's go. And they get out to the field and And Cain surprised him, and he killed his brother Abel. Cain didn't confess. He didn't repent of his sin concerning his attitude and his evil works. He chose to let sin get the better of him. In other words, he said, no, God. In fact, you, you want a blood offering? I'll give you a blood offering. Hey, bro, let's go for a walk. Cain wanted sin. Cain Cain wanted revenge. Friends, at every decision in our lives, there's a why in the road. We can make a decision to do what is hard right now, which is to honor God. That decision is always hardest then, but the more we make the repeated decision to glorify God with our lives, the easier it becomes as we see the wisdom of bringing glory and honor to God. Every time we make the, hard, the decision that is harder to make right now, I'm sorry, that is easier to make right now, the harder it will become over the progression of your life and the, 
the more difficult it will be to get from this track back over to this track. Mark it down. Some of you are living at the end of that harder or easier track right now. But I don't know how to get back right now. I, I, I don't know what to do to get back right now. Friends, if you're hearing this this morning, and you are, Jesus is the way back. Well, I'm already a Christian. Well, the gospel doesn't stop once you become a Christian and you're five years a Christian and 20 years a Christian. Every day we need to learn to apply the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is simply that on my own I can do nothing to bring God glory. And I need the Spirit's help with it, which if you're a Christian, you have the Spirit's help. But brothers and sisters, having the Spirit's help does not in anywhere in the Word of God say that that makes the task easy. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say changing that, that habit now becomes easy. No, but it is possible. It is possible to bring glory to God after a week, a month, a year, a decade, even I would say a lifetime of welcoming sin, following sin. You may, you may be a Christian who says, I've been running from the Lord for a long time. Come home. Come home. So this is the first murder that's recorded in the Bible. It's the, it's, I don't know if it's the first sort of shocking sin, uh, but it is a little bit shocking, right? In a way, this battle between Cain and Abel, it, it represents the battle that God spoke of to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15, right? Between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Maybe the, the devil thought by getting Cain to kill Abel, this would stop the promise given in Genesis 3.15. We don't want to say too much about the things that we don't know. We're going to work with what God has given us. That's very plain and very clear. We know that Jesus overcame the devil and the devil no longer has authority or power he is defeated. The race, the race, well, the battle is won. Jesus won the battle when he uh, rose from the grave. All right, a couple other times when Satan tried to upend the Lord here, killing all of the children at the time of Moses that we read in Exodus 1, and Herod killing all of the children after Jesus was born a babe in the manger. In the manger. Satan devised a plan and he worked through evil kings to say, we're going we're gonna to blot this guy out. I can't let this happen. Each and every time, friends, Jesus overcame. The Lord wins every time. And I want to say, typically, if you do well, typically you will feel well. I want to use that expression, feeling a little bit uh, tenuous, a little bit cautious, because our feelings can be misleading. But a lot of times, a lot of times our, our disposition works very well, like a light on the dashboard of a car, right? You've got certain lights where you know, okay, this is the oil, right? This is the temperature. And then you've got the, the light that's just, oh, this could be anything, All right? It's the catch-all. Sometimes our emotions uh, are cueing us to something that's wrong internally, something that's wrong with our relationship with the Lord. Generally, when we're at peace with the Lord, we'll feel at peace with the Lord. It doesn't mean everything is calm. It doesn't mean life is easy. It means, generally speaking, there's peace in walking with the Lord. Sometimes that means obedience over months and years through great difficulty and great trial. Sometimes it means very difficult circumstances. David Brainerd was a missionary who dealt with sickness almost his entire missionary service and didn't see any, maybe one soul come to Christ. By our standards, we say, we're going to drop our support. He's not an effective ministry. He's not very good at it. But it wasn't until after David Brainerd lived a faithful life to God and passed away that his ministry after the effect began to blow up. It was only in reading David Brainerd's journals that we see the pursuit of godliness and the peace he had in Christ in the midst of great difficulty. 
Friends, whatever you go through, God will give you peace. I assure you, it's, it's not your timeline. I can almost assure you it's not going to be in the way that you would draw it up. But God will provide for you and God will give you peace. With persistent unbelief, I'm sorry, persistent unbelief becomes embedded pride, which leads to habitual sin. Think of it like this as our second point. Small obedience, which is unbelief. I'm sorry, small disobedience, which is unbelief. When unchecked, becomes embedded pride. And it it always leads to larger embedded disobedient, or we might call it habitual sin. Small disobedience, when unchecked, Cain brought the wrong offering to the Lord. It was a willful sin. He brought the the wrong offering, but he wasn't too far gone. But then when the Lord challenges him on it and says, you need to check yourself. You need to check your sin. You need to keep your sin in check. He steps back and he sort of crosses his arms and he says, no, I think I got a way to fix this. I think I can get you a blood offering. You ever do something and as soon as you do it or as soon as you say it, you realize, I can't get that back. I mean, the words are gone. Maybe the other person hasn't even heard them yet. And you're just like begging the Lord, please don't let them hear that. No, you said it. It's out. So what do we do? Oh, I I was just kidding. I was just kidding. Proverbs says, like a madman firing brands into an open field, fire brands into an open field. So was the one who says, I was only joking. It's usually just a way to cover up something that you can't get back. He knew what kind of offering to bring. He didn't bring it. The Lord said, what have you done? Remember, it's the same way that he began to ask Adam questions. The first question is to teach him something. The first question is to help him see it, to help him own up to it. Right? Adam could have said, Right, the Lord said, hey, Adam, where are you? Really? You can't see me? I'm going to get away with this thing. Why are you hiding? He could have right there just said, because I sinned. And now I, I, mean, I just feel really bad. I don't know how to explain this. God may have said something like, well, that's called Shame. And unfortunately, when, when you sin, you're going to feel shame. But, but here's the thing. I'm still your good God. And one day there will be a way to make this right. But for now, we're going to introduce blood sacrifices. For now, we're going to introduce some things that are going to begin to teach you and your children and your children's children for many, many generations to come that I'm holy and that you need to obey what I tell you because I'm God. Well, I don't understand. It's okay. Just trust. You need to trust me. Isn't it easy to come in this morning and tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Do you notice the song says sweet, not easy. But if you've trusted Jesus through difficulty, you know it is sweet. It's wonderful. But often we want to disobey God, flagrant disobedience. And then we're shocked when consequences come. And so God brings conviction, which we often wrongly perceive as mean. God's not giving me everything I want. How dare he? Well, what about when you openly, flagrantly sinned against God? Well, yeah, but he should forgive me. God's nice. No, God is holy. God is merciful and gracious, which is very different than nice. Cain, what have you done? Have you, oh, that was going back to Adam there. He knows the the, the, the answer when he asks Cain, where's your brother Abel? Right? This is a, it's a teaching question again. He's giving Cain another opportunity to repent. He's giving Cain another opportunity to acknowledge his sin. But now Cain's smaller disobedience remains unchecked, 
and it becomes embedded pride, which is now an all-out battle with God. Okay, you've dug your heels in. Now you're ready for battle. Let's see how this works for you. I don't know. Didn't bring the right offering. Hey, bro, let's go to the field. Yeah, sure, let's go. Kills his brother. Cain, where's your brother? I I don't know. Outright lying to the omniscient one, the one who knows everything, the one who, who, who with God's word, not just the written word we hold here, but God's spoken word, dealing with his people in the Old Testament and through the prophets would just like a, like a masterful surgeon with a scalpel, just, just cut open his heart with questions. We just try to hide it. We try to cover. We try to cover our shame. We try to cover our spiritual nakedness. I don't know. And then you can almost hear like the three-year-old argument, right? I don't know where he is. Am I supposed to watch out for him all the time? Am I my brother's keeper? Parents, encourage your children to learn to confess their sin when they're little, when they're young. It's not just... And one pastor from the Chicagoland area, Rob Reno, he just kind of refers to it as, sorry, it's okay. (laughs) Right? You hit your brother in the face with that truck. Go say you're sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. (laughs) Something about that feels like reconciliation hasn't really happened. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not always great with people, but something seems a little off there. In fact, sometimes it's, it's good to say, you know, this is something that you need to confess to the Lord and call it sin because it's wrong. And when your heart is ready, you need to come back and you need to apologize. I don't mean there's never a time for saying you need to apologize to your brother right now because that's really what needs to happen. It's just... Sometimes helping the heart and the will align. And there's wisdom in how you go through that as, as, as parents. But teach your children that relationship can be quickly restored when sin is confessed, when a wrong is, is acknowledged, and we don't minimize wrong behavior with, well, I didn't really mean to. Really? Because like, I mean, there's a couple motions in there that seem like intent. Maybe it wasn't planned out an hour ago, but it didn't seem like an accident. Accidents happen. Mistakes happen. Much of our life is not mistake. It's outright sin. And what, do we, what else do we need to teach them? We need to teach them that consequences remain even when we are genuinely repentant. We confess our sin to the Lord and we apologize to the person who still has a black eye and reconciliation can happen while the eye takes a week to heal. What have you done, God says to Cain? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. God God can no longer act in a way that's simply merciful with Cain. Cain offered the wrong sacrifice. He became angry. He became jealous. That led to this deep-seated, stubborn anger. And he went after his brother and he killed him. I want to ask you, you, friend, do you you wrestle with, with anger? Do you wrestle with bitterness? Do you wrestle with jealousy? Does the Holy Spirit regularly remind you that you have unconfessed sin to deal with? Well, it was a long time ago. Am I supposed to remember every sin that I've ever done and confess them all to the Lord? Am I my brother's keeper? The simple answer to that is no. We'd never remember all of our sin. But see, you're you're painting God because of your shame You're painting God as uncaring, unreasonable, unjust, and at the end of the day, unloving. But that's not God. You just don't want to fess up. Just call it what it is. Stubborn, rebellious pride. And stubborn, rebellious pride gets covered over layer, over layer, over layer with other things in life that suppress the voice of the Holy Spirit, which is in fact loving, friends. But you sit there in life and you, you blame other people and you minimize God's love. 
and you explain it to others. By the way, if you happen to be sitting like this in church, I don't mean that's you. <laughs> I do this. I see people kind of like, uh, should I? It's fine. You just relax. Sit back. It's fine. It's good. Just listen to the Lord together. But if you've grieved God's spirit by silencing his conviction, you may think, oh, oh, I don't hear his voice convicting me of this anymore. That should scare you out of your pants. Because the moment the Holy Spirit lifts his loving effort of bringing you conviction is the moment he may say, fine, you want your sin? Go have it. You want this life that's just misery inside for you? Fine. Go have it. But as long as you are alive, as Hebrews says, as long it is, as it is still called today, turn from your sin turn to the Savior for the very first time or again and again and again. That, that deep-seated emotion you feel plagued by may be God's ongoing warning where he's saying, I'm calling you to repent and joy just around the corner. Just around the corner. But God says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's effort. Sometimes wrongs need to be made right. Sometimes reconciliation needs to happen. Do you marry an unbeliever? Knowing that God says, don't be unequally yoked. And now you wonder why you're struggling with these decisions in life. How to, how to, make certain decisions, how to, well, all kinds of things. Well, why would God let me have, ha, why would God let this happen? Why do I have to endure this struggle? Well, you disobeyed God and you married an unbeliever. I'm not talking about if you're both unbelievers and you, you, one of you gets saved and now you're married to an unbeliever, that's different. I'm saying God says, don't marry an unbeliever. You choose to marry an unbeliever and now you're struggling with it, maybe for your entire life. Friend, do you know if you'll confess that, if you'll repent to the Lord with that? You're still married to an unbeliever, but you're made right with God. And now you'll be able to see clearly how God wants you to prioritize that that is the first goal of your life. Maybe you need to pull back on serving in the church some because your priority is to live in such a way that God might use your life, your, your silent, joyous living in relationship, loving that person that you love so much and begging the Lord to save him or her. There's joy even in that struggle, you're not eternally separated from God because of his grace. I could list, as I was writing this, I had a list of many, many, many examples, and I thought, I don't even really need to list them. Just give one or two to get you in a category. You know what they are. You know how the Lord's been speaking to you out of his love. And you either say, God, thank you for loving me enough to warn me. Thank you for loving me enough to convict me. Thank you for giving us promises like 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you notice the connection there was 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 13? No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man, but God is faithful. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can have joy. You can have peace with the Lord while consequences maintain. In fact, some of your decisions, some of my decisions lead to consequences that are lifelong and that are never going to change, and God will give you joy. In fact, God may even redeem your previous life of sin in ways that only God can. He may give you a, a ministry platform to ministering to others who struggle with the same decisions that you have made. He may give you uh, a way to come alongside people in a way that I don't want to say only you can, because you don't have to have struggled with something to be able to help people who are struggling with something. 
but it can be a really effective way that God may use you. Friends, there's grace. There's grace all over the place that God will use our messed up lives to bring him glory. We don't ever want to be a church that says, you can't wrestle with sin if you come here. What we can't do is continually give in to sin and just pat people on the back. We need to battle sin. We need to learn how to battle sin in one another's lives. Or you stubbornly cling to your sin. And you say, oh, it's not me. It's the alcohol and drugs. That's why I feel this way. What are you covering up? What are you hiding from? It's not me. I know the Lord keeps telling me I need to have a conversation with that person, but no. I mean, it was a long time ago. I don't need to have that conversation anymore. They probably don't even remember it. I bet they do. I know God says that I'm supposed to have that conversation, but that would be really awkward. So your comfort is more of a priority to you than obeying God's word and pursuing reconciliation. Maybe you're not on the wrongdoer's side. Maybe you're the one that needs to go to someone else and say, friend, I care about you. I'm not sure what to do about this. Maybe I'm perceiving this wrongly, but I need to see if we're on the same page with this. Am I understanding this in the right way? Is there, is there something that I've done? Please tell me. Don't just nod and smile and say everything's okay. If it's not, that'd be the worst. Let's live in such a way that when unbelievers come in, they say, whoa, those people are totally different. And somehow they love each other. I know that didn't happen naturally in my life. What's the deal here, guys? We just love Jesus, and he helps us heal. He helps us grow together. No, it's not me. It's the, your boss, your colleague, your neighbor, your adult child, your young child, your parent, your pastor, your spouse, your ex. It's not me. It's not me. Friends, that's precarious ground. It's a dangerous place to be. Everybody else can sin, but no, not, not me. No. Cain embraced sin. He ignored God's gracious warning, which was for his good, and then he stubbornly stood his ground. Friends, sin always believe, begins with wrong thoughts, and if you let those wrong thoughts go on, they lead to wrong feelings. If you let those wrong feelings go unchecked, they lead to wrong words. If you let those wrong words continue going or to go unrepented for or to go unchecked, they lead to wrong actions. If you let those wrong actions continue persistently in your life, they lead to wrong habits. And our culture has turned wrong habits into things that are sometimes called diseases. Now, can wrong habits lead to things that cause physiological disease? Absolutely. Absolutely. But the wrong habits, the wrong patterns that have developed wrong habits in themselves are in most cases, in many cases, I'll say, unchecked sin that we've clung to and devising ways to hide it, to cover it, to escape, and to run away. If an acorn falls in a forest and you're on a walk and you see it, it's really easy to pick up, right? You might be on a walk as a family and the smallest of children can reach down and pick up that acorn. But if that acorn remains and that acorn becomes embedded in the soil, that acorn becomes a small oak tree. And for a while, a small, a small oak tree with, with, with small roots is not too hard to uproot, whether with a, a shovel or even just your hand. But leave that longer and that small oak tree becomes a great mighty oak with deeply embedded roots. It takes a monstrous effort. Or derecho. To remove. Abel's blood was crying out to the Lord from the ground, and Cain would now receive God's judgment. Quickly, Cain is cursed from the ground because habitual sin, left unchecked, leads to God's judgment. He's cursed from the ground, even beyond the discipline that was brought to Adam, because Adam, it seems, had some level of repentance. 
Would there even be a seed of sorrow in Cain's heart? Maybe. It doesn't, doesn't look that way, but maybe. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. So he even goes to the Lord and he says, I know you warned me to stop. I know you warned me to watch over my sin. I know I crossed my arms and I, and I, I girded in my feet. I know I've been fighting you the whole way. And now, how dare you punish me like this? What did I ever do? Behold, God, you've driven me away today from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I'm not sure why that bothered him because he really didn't want a fellowship with God before. He wanted to be his own God. He wanted to live his own way. From your face I shall be hidden. I'll be a fugitive, a wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. It's too much, God. I can't bear it. You're mean. You're unjust, judgmental. And now he's entitled. God, how dare you treat me this way? Proverbs 19.3, when, uh, when a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. Does your heart rage against the Lord? Oh, you know better than to actually say that out loud, especially around church people. But inside, oh, friends, I've known some really, really angry people inside. Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace for the wicked. I'm not wicked, I'm just struggling with this. No, you've made wicked decision after wicked decision after wicked decision, and that makes a wicked person. But it does not make a wicked person that is too far from the grasp of the Lord to save or to restore. But if you've sat here week after week after week after month after month, maybe after year after year, and you consistently push down the, the loving voice of the Holy Spirit of God, let today be the day. You don't have to leave here angry. You don't have to leave here miserable. You might leave here with tears, but there'll be tears of joy, tears of freedom, tears of relief. And not from a God who says, now you better perform right. From a God who says, welcome home. Let's do this together. Let me show you what I can do with your mess of a life. That's God, friends. Persistent unbelief becomes embedded pride leading to habitual sin and to complaining and to self-pity. Oh, see God's grace in verse 15. The Lord said, not so, Cain. Nobody's going to kill you. If anybody kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. The Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. We don't know anything about the mark. We don't need to know anything about the mark. But we, I've heard some crazy theories on what was the mark of Cain. Friends, don't miss the forest for the random sapling over there. It was intentional. It was God's love. Because you see, if God was unloving, God would have just zapped him right then and there. And in fact, that actually wouldn't make God unloving. I misspoke. But we see the extra mile that God has gone to to show his mercy. Disobedience after disobedience after disobedience after disobedience. Friend, today can be your day. Do you know someone who, it seems, you don't know their heart, but it seems They've been stiff-arming the Lord for day after day, week after week, month after month. Well, I don't want to say anything because they, they're pretty angry. Friend, if you don't say anything, you may be the vessel God has chosen to bring the word of God to them. Say something in love. Let's not worship our comfort. The blood of Abel from the ground could never accomplish what the blood of Jesus accomplishes. The blood of Jesus is better than any Old Testament sacrifice. The blood of Jesus is the only sacrifice from one man who could heal the sins of many and who could bring redemption and life, full life, to anyone who would call upon his name for salvation. No, don't go try to pretty yourself up before you go to God. Don't try to heal yourself before you go to God. Go to the healer who will redeem you if you simply call upon his name. 
Well, I need to do X, Y, and Z first. No, that's a lie from the enemy. You need to go to the Lord, throw up your hands, fall on your knees, fall on the face, get a good ugly cry out and say, God, I need you. I'm desperate. I can't do this. I'm stubborn. I'm angry. I hate people. I think I might even not like you, but that feels wrong to say. It is, by the way, but save me. You believe in your heart that Jesus is God and that God raised him from the dead and you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. That's a promise for everyone. This is the time today to come to the Lord, acknowledge your sin, fall on his mercy and repentance, which is worship, by the way. Leave your burden at the cross and walk out a joy-filled person getting to figure out how joyful your life can be, even enduring difficulty ahead of you. But with the Lord, with the body of Christ, you can do it. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Not the not so bad sin, all sin. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, as we read earlier, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friend, if you believe this this morning and you would confess Jesus as your savior, come worship with us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, all that Jesus did to make a way for everybody who does not deserve anything to make it back to the Lord. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Come today. We have two stations up front, actually three. We have one that's gluten-free over here. We have two stations in the back. We want to invite you just if you want to go right away, go right away. If you want to take some time and sit and pray, we invite you to feel free to do that. If you want to talk with someone, I'm going to ask the elders of our church to come forward during this communion time, and we just want to make ourselves available to pray with you. But what if people see me? Oh, don't, don't. Let people see you come to Jesus. Let people see you express the need for the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for all that you have done for us to be able to have a relationship with you after we've done so much in our life to to walk away from you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for demonstrating your love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you that we get to worship you now. Let us see clearly how you would lead us, apply this to our lives today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's worship together. Pastors and others will be down front to talk with you if you need.